Hey everyone, Ryan here. Welcome back to our oral surgery series. In this video, we're going to talk about temporomandibular joint disorders. So it's often referred to as TMJ, which is actually a misnomer. TMJ stands for temporomandibular joint. And so we all have TMJ, two in fact, one on the right and one on the left. But TMD, which stands for temporomandibular joint disorder or dysfunction, is what we'll be focusing on in this video. But first, let's very briefly go over some basic TMJ anatomy. So the temporomandibular joint is the articulation between the condyle and the glenoid or mandibular fossa. So the condyle is the condylar head of the mandible bone. The mandibular fossa or the glenoid fossa is this concavity in the temporal bone, and the articular eminence is this convexity also in the temporal bone. Now between this articulation between the condyle and the fossa is this amazing fibrous structure called the articular disc. And this, again, sits between the condyle and the fossa, and it's essential for proper TMJ function. So the articular disc, which we can see right here, actually separates the joint space into two separate cavities or compartments. The lower joint space, which is in here, is involved with rotation. This is where the condyle rotates during hinge movement, where the lower jaw is going from a closed position to about halfway open. The upper compartment, which is shown here, is instead involved with translation. This is where the condyle slides down and forward along the articular eminence during sliding movement. So this is where the jaw is going into maximum opening position or protrusive or lateral excursive movements. So simply knowing that rotation occurs in the lower space and translation occurs in the upper space and maybe recalling this diagram with the arrows to help support that will net you at least a question or two on the board exam. So let's talk about the muscles next. So muscles of mastication, there are four of those, and they're responsible for moving the mandible. So very generally what they're involved in, the lateral pterygoid is involved with opening of the mandible, whereas the masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoids are involved with closing the mandible in some way. It's a very basic general overview, but these are the four muscles of mastication and generally what they're doing. Now there are also ligaments involved with the TMJ and ligaments on the flip side of the muscles limit the movement of the mandible and keep the muscles in check. So the four that I just wanna talk about briefly are listed here. The capsular ligament, is what completely covers the TMJ joint space, and you'd actually need to puncture this ligament to access the superior or upper joint space, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this video. The discal or collateral ligament attaches to the medial and later lateral poles of the condyle. So that would be what we can see here from the screen and what would be on the other side that we can't see, sort of like a bucket handle. And this keeps the disc attached to the condyle during movement. The posterior ligament goes from the articular disc to the back of the condyle. It tethers to the back of the condyle in order to prevent anterior disc displacement. The lateral ligament wraps around the condyle and attaches to the articular disc to prevent posterior disc displacement. And we'll talk about disc displacement in just a little bit. And lastly, for some reason, the board exam likes to ask frequently about blood supply to the TMJ. So I will ask you guys to remember this acronym, MADS, and it stands for the maxillary artery, ascending pharyngeal artery, deep auricular artery, and the superficial temporal artery. And there are more than this, but these are the ones to know for the board exam. So just remember MADS. All right, so now let's talk about 
some temporomandibular joint dysfunction? What can go wrong with all of that anatomy we just talked about? So disc displacement or internal derangement, these are synonymous, is when the articular disc is in the wrong place, either anteriorly or posteriorly. So this can happen with reduction or without reduction. So with reduction means that there's a click involved, an actual clicking sound. And so we see this in the first image, the disc is anteriorly displaced. Here's the glenoid fossa and the articular eminence. Here's the condyle, and here is the disc. And so the clicking sound happens as the condyle pops over this anteriorly displaced disc and then also pops on the way back to its fossa. So the condyle can still move, pulled by those muscles, but the ligaments failed or there is some internal failure here where the disc is now anteriorly displaced and doesn't follow the condyle back into the glenoid fossa where it's supposed to be. So when you have reduction with your disc displacement, you get this clicking sound. The other option is without reduction, where the condyle is locked in place. So the condyle is stuck behind the anteriorly displaced disc, resulting in limited range of motion. And if this only happens on one side, only one TMJ is affected, there is an ipsilateral deviation on opening. And we'll talk about this in the next slide. So essentially, the mandible is going to deviate towards one side, towards the side that's being locked in place because the condyle can no longer translate down the articular eminence like it's supposed to. So on the board exam, they could ask you to characterize internal derangement with reduction. And so you would need to know that that's the one with clicking. So just to remember, with reduction is click, without reduction, you're locked in place, you're good to go. So different opening patterns. We have deflection, where the mandible deflects towards one side at maximum opening. And as I alluded to in the last slide, it's going to deflect towards the side that is stuck, and that's at maximum opening. And that's because the condyle on that side can only rotate and it can't translate, so the mandible will swing in that direction. In other words, if the right TMJ is stuck in place, the mandible is going to open to and deviate towards that right side. Another opening pattern is deviation, and this is where the mandible deviates towards one side and then returns back to midline at maximum opening. Now this one doesn't necessarily have to be involved with TMD. This could be a normal a variation of normal. How I remember and differentiate these two is that deviation has a V in the word. And if you notice the movement here, the pattern that's formed is a V. So I remember deviation is the one that forms a V. Now, since I mentioned they're not deviation can be uh, involved with TMD or it cannot be, but symptoms of pain and tenderness upon palpation of the TMJ are usually associated with deviation of the jaw to the painful side upon opening of the mandible. So next we have recurrent dislocation. So dislocating your jaw can occur. This is rare, but if you're cheering really loud at a baseball game and you're opening your jaw up really, really wide and the condyle translates so far forward that it gets stuck in front of the articular eminence instead of returning back to its fossa. So in other words, the mandibular condyle translates anterior to, to the articular eminence and requires mechanical manipulation to achieve reduction. And reduction, we saw this word before, that's where the joint is, it's able to return to its fossa. 
So to reposition the jaw, you need to rotate the jaw down, which is counterclockwise in this image, and then back in order to get over the hump of the articular eminence. Now in more chronic cases, treatment can involve Botox injection of the lateral pterygoid muscle or surgery. All right, next we have ankylosis, which is the union between condyle and skull, which can either be bony or fibrous in nature. So just like the tooth can fuse to bone, the condyle can actually fuse to the skull. Trauma is the most common cause of ankylosis, but surgery, radiation therapy, and infection can also lead to ankylosis of the TMJ. And this, as you can imagine, would cause severely restricted range of motion. Bruxism is another form of TMD. This involves clenching and or grinding of the teeth, and it can be during the day and or at night while you're sleeping. It's usually caused or exacerbated by stress. Common treatment for bruxism would be the use of an occlusal guard. This is a very fancy night guard that's made by the dentist, fabricated particularly for your teeth, your mouth, and the way that you bite together. And the idea of an occlusal guard is to distribute occlusal forces more evenly among all the teeth and to relax the muscles of mastication. And that is definitely something I would know for the board exam. All right, so let's get into a little bit more non-surgical therapy for TMD. Uh, disc displacement, internal derangement, you're having issues with pain and tenderness upon palpation of the TMJ. Here are some non-surgical approaches. Counseling to address parafunctional habits like grinding, like the bruxism we just talked about, nail biting, and also stress management, which can cause or exacerbate these things. Medical therapy can be considered. You can use NSAIDs, steroids, analgesics, antidepressants, and or muscle relaxants. Physical therapy can also be very effective. This could involve transcutaneous electrical and nerve stimulation, massage, thermal treatment, and or exercise. Occlusion so we just talked about the occlusal guard. You can also use uh, occlusal splints to reduce intra-articular pressure. And so sometimes in very minor cases, you can bite down on popsicle sticks on both sides, and this actually unloads the jaw and can relax the muscles. Arthrocentesis involves using two needles to flush out the superior joint space. So I alluded to this a little bit earlier in the video, and so you actually have to puncture that capsular ligament we talked about before in order to access and then flush out the superior joint space. So you flush in some saline with this syringe and then flush out that, that uh, needle there. So you have two needles in order to clean out that joint space. How about some surgical therapy? So you have arthroscopy, which involves two cannulas and instrumentation within that superior joint space. So again, we're puncturing that capsular ligament. Arthroplasty is disc repositioning surgery. So this is for painful, persistent clicking or a closed lock when you, have, you don't have reduction of the joint. Discectomy is disc repair or removal when it's severely damaged. So this would be, uh, you could actually replace the articular disc if it were removed. Some preferred replacement materials include the part of the temporalis muscle and fascia, fat, and or our auricular cartilage from the ear. A condylotomy involves a vertical ramus osteotomy shown here, and that osteotomy, which we had talked about in the orthognathic surgery videos, that's a cut through the bone, 
it's not fixated. So it's not fixated together. There's no internal fixation with mini plates and bone screws in order to allow the soft tissues to naturally reposition the condyle and the disc into a better position. There's also total joint replacement for severely pathologic joints like in osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. So in the order I'm listing these, also including the non-surgical options, we're basically starting from very conservative options to more aggressive options where the conservative options just aren't working. So total joint replacement can involve an osteochondral bone graft where rib joints are actually the most common autogenous material used to replace the condyle. This can also include total prosthetic joint replacement or reconstruction, which involves a prosthetic condyle and a prosthetic fossa. Now for the board exam, one thing to know is that the nerve that's most likely damaged during TMJ surgery is the facial nerve. So that's cranial nerve number seven. So all of these issues we've talked about in this video can be placed into the category of temporomandibular joint disorders, again, TMD. And many of them, if they involve the muscles of mastication, can be classified as myofascial pain syndrome, or MPS. Now from our last video on orofacial pain, this would be in the somatic pain category, particularly in the musculoskeletal pain category. So myofascial pain syndrome is a chronic muscular pain disorder. It's the most common cause of masticatory pain. It involves trigger points in the muscles of mastication diffuse pain in the preauricular region, that's in front of the ear, again, right where that TMJ is, parafunctional habits like bruxism can contribute to it, and the reason I bring this up is that the board exam will ask about myofascial pain syndrome a lot. So a question might say, this patient has crepitus or clicking in the TMJ, trigger points of tenderness in the temporalis muscle, limited opening or limited range of motion, pain at rest, etc. And all of these are symptoms of myofascial pain syndrome. So being able to pick this out of a lineup of answer choices can be really, really helpful. And treatment for this syndrome is a lot of the same things that we mentioned before because Again, this is closely linked to TMD. So physical therapy, stress management, splint therapy, and medications are all viable treatment options for MPS. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you and shout out to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for all of their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides and additional practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. I'll leave a link in the description below. Thanks again for watching everyone and I'll see you all in the next video.